Good morning. I hope you're all having a good day. Uh, we're going to finish uh, chapter 11, and we'll start a little bit of the review for next week's midterm. So on Monday, I left off talking about what's called osmotic pressure. And osmosis and osmotic pressure are the same thing. Osmosis is the act, if you will, of having a pressure. And what's really interesting to me about osmotic pressure, it's the pressure of a solution. So solutions with solutes and solvents can actually push, if you will, kind of like a gas. And they will actually have a measurable pressure. And the things that it relates to are given right here. Um, pi is used as the symbol for this osmotic pressure. And again, this is not the 3.14 number from math. Um, this is the Greek, like, P symbol, if you will. So I think what they did is pressure P was supposed to be for gases, and pi is supposed to be for solutions, but I'm just the messenger. Anyway, the osmotic pressure is literally just a pressure measured in atmospheres. So just like from the gas laws, you know, 760 millimeters of mercury is atmosphere, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. T is the Kelvin temperature. R is the gas R, 0 0.082057. Um, we talked a little bit briefly about the Van Hoft factor, and we'll do more in uh, recitation this week if I didn't see you yesterday. The Van Hoft factor is used for ionic compounds. So for example, NaCl <coughs> breaks up into Na plus and Cl minus two pieces from one piece, so the I factor would be two. But for most uh, organic things, the I factor is just one. And finally, the C there is actually molarity again, because these are solutions, and molarity is kind of the king of chemistry. So molarity is what people use. And what happens is, uh, for example, let's say you have a solution inside this little bag. And the bag is what they call a semi-permeable membrane. And what that means here is that the solvent, which is often water, can go back and forth through the bag. But the solute inside, sugar, hydrated, sodium chloride, dissolved, whatever, um, it's too big, all right? <coughs> Like you can think about it like the ion dipole forces are working and so you have these huge hydrated molecules that don't fit through the little holes. So if the solvent water can go back and forth, there is a propensity for the pure solvent to rush into the solution. And this is a really interesting phenomenon. So let's say you had like three moles per liter sodium chloride solution in the bag and you had pure water outside. After you let this sit for a while, the water is gonna rush into the bag, all right? So your three moles per liter might become like two moles per liter. I, I'm just making these numbers up. But the concentration will actually diminish as the solvent rushes through. And you have to do something with that extra solvent so in this case, it actually has a measurable pressure. This is like the pressure columns we saw for mercury back in the gas law section. So a lot of times the osmotic pressures literally are read with a thermom or a, a ruler, all right? They're millimeters or centimeters of mercury, something like that. And you can relate it there. The water level uh, here would go down, <clears throat> all right? And the solution pressure would push this up a little bit. This is a real fascinating phenomena, and we're going to talk more about why osmosis is possible in Chem 223. But for right now, what you need to know is this is the fourth of these colligative properties. And again, just to review, colligative property is like a superhero power of solutions, all right? And we talked about, and we will talk about in the prom set today or tomorrow, if you have a lab, how the vapor pressure is lowered in a solution relative to a solvent. We saw how boiling points of solutions are higher than the solvents they came from. And likewise, the freezing points of solutions are lower than the solvents they came from. And now this fourth one is that you have the potential for osmosis. And if you have osmosis, you do have to have the semi-permeable membrane, so solvent goes back and forth. But this desire for the solvent to rush into the solution is something that causes osmosis to be possible. Joseph? The stuff in the tube is solution. Yes, that's right. And the reason that it's not as much like water as it can be is because of some latent effect of the barrier that's holding it together. Yeah. So strong enough that it doesn't 
Right. There's a disease. There's a desire, Joseph, for everything to be messy and the same. And this is a preview of something we'll see in Chem 223. But outside you have pure water, and inside you have some kind of solute. And the solution I rationalize is trying to make it more like, um, like everything the same. So if the water rushes in, your concentration goes down. <clears throat> it becomes more like the pure solvent and stuff. It, yeah, that's right. If you're curious about this, and you can't wait to Chem 223, and, and, and who can, by the way, but anyway, okay, Profat back on, I'm getting excited for Chem 223 is my favorite. Profat really on. <clears throat> yeah, this, this, uh, this phenomena is due to something called entropy, and we'll talk about that a lot more in Chem 223, but for right now, just realize that this is another thing that solutions can do that you couldn't have from just pure solvents. Cool. All right. So, when a solution and a pure solvent are separated by a semi-permeable membrane, solvent can flow in both directions, but the solute cannot. Here, pure water moves into the solution, working to bring both the solution and pure water to the same concentration. This process, osmosis, continues until the flow of water across the membrane is balanced by the pressure exerted by the water column. Whoa, sorry about that, had a little spaz there. Um, in this video, what's happening is the pure water is rushing in, all right, and it forces the solution column to get higher. So the water went down and the column got higher. Now, after a while, gravity is gonna start pulling on this column. So it can't go like up, 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 necessarily. It probably stopped somewhere. <clears throat> and the difference between where it started and stopped is how they measure the solution. Um, this is a little picture that shows one of these quote-unquote semi-permeable membranes. And all substances have some holes in them. Even the BCCs and FCCs we saw, I mean, in theory, you could have like photons or something go through. There's always going to be some space, all right? And most of these substances, like uh, our plastics and stuff like that, they'll have little holes or whatever through them. And it's easier for the solvents to go through than the solutes. And a lot of this is due to the ion dipole force. And if you look right here, this is a positive cation and water is surrounding it and the negative part of water, the negative dipole is attracted to the positive side. These guys are pretty big, all right? It's not just the cation or anion, it's also the waters around it. And so they're harder to get through these little holes. Uh, here's a negative anion being surrounded by the positive parts. So again, water can go back and forth. The solute is not supposed to go back and forth in osmosis. And the desire for the solution is that more of the solvent is going to rush to the side of the solute, trying to make those concentration numbers decrease. Yeah? Is it the intermolecular forces that are doing this? Causing this attraction? So if you put benzene, there would be no reaction because water doesn't react with benzene? The, is it more of a vortex? The intermolecular forces help to make cations and anions bigger, all right? But it's really, I, I would argue, Joseph, it's more about just the size of the solvent molecules relative to the solutes. Like um, in the lab, um, uh, we did like this week, benzoic acid and that um, laurel, uh, laurel alcohol thing. Those were both really big, bigger grams per mole. That's what I would argue. But all, all these things together, Joseph, make the picture. Yeah. And like Let's biology, uh -huh. there's like the concentration gradient. Yes. And then like the um, electric forces. And that's what's kind of making them in between. But the bigger molecules can't go through all the time. Yeah, that's exactly it. <laughs> A lot of the gradients in biology are based on osmosis. So there's some other things going on there too, but I would argue that a lot of them totally are osmosis. Osmosis is really important for biology and biochemistry more than like traditional chemistry. Cool. All right. When a solution and a pure solvent are separated by a semi-permeable membrane, solvent can flow in both directions, but the solute cannot. Here, pure water moves into the solution working to bring both the solution and pure water to the same concentration. This process, osmosis, continues until the flow of water across the membrane is balanced by the pressure exerted by the water column. A semi-permeable membrane blocks solute molecules, but allows solvent molecules to pass in both directions. 
The number of solvent molecules moving from the solution side to the pure solvent side is less than the number moving into the solution side, resulting in a net flow into the solution. I wanted to show this video, so sorry for repeating this one, but um, so molecules of the solvent are going back and forth. It's not just one way, but there's a net rush of the solvent to the solution side away from the solvent side. And uh, going back to what Joseph said, this was a sugar solution, and sugars are usually a pretty high molar mass substance, and so higher molar mass, just they don't fit through those little holes quite as readily. All right, here's an example of where osmosis is really cool. And again, if you're in biology or you're planning on going into biochemistry, this is a real useful kind of application. Now, in lab this week, all right, you did yesterday or you will today or tomorrow, uh, the goal was to find the molar mass of the solute. And that works really well for traditional chemistry. But if you want to have the molar mass of something like hemoglobin, the freezing points and boiling point kind of things don't work as well as osmosis. So I wanted to show you an example of finding the molar mass of this huge hemoglobin molecule, all right? And again, this is one place now where osmosis is definitely superior to the freezing point, boiling point applications that we're doing in lab this week. So in this problem, we got 35 grams of hemoglobin in a liter of solution. The pressure, the osmotic pressure, 10 millimeters of mercury. So on a ruler, if you visualize a centimeter, all right, that's how much the pressure would change upon making this solution, uh, figuring out the osmosis. So if you're at 25 degrees Celsius, you can actually calculate the molar mass of the hemoglobin. And remember, molar mass is always grams per mole. We've got the grams part of the hemoglobin. We're after the moles of hemoglobin in this example. <clears throat> So if you want to do these kind of problems, turn your osmotic pressure into atmospheres. So 10 divided by 760, which is the conversion, 0 0.0132 atmospheres is the osmotic pressure. And that's the pi. That's that little thing that goes right there. And so just like in the ideal gas law, we always used atmospheres. You want to use atmospheres in osmosis as well. The only thing we don't know right now is the concentration of the hemoglobin, but we can determine that. We've got the pi from the previous uh, slide. Here's our good R. This is the gas R, 0.082057. And 25 degrees Celsius in Kelvin is 298. So the concentration of hemoglobin in the solution 5.40 times 10 to the minus fourth moles per liter. So we're assuming that I is one. Yes, why is that a good assumption? Uh, because this, because it seems to be covalent. Yeah, that's okay. right. Anything kind of bio, that's a really silly thing to say as a scientist, as a teacher, anything biology sounding, biochemistry <laughs> sounding, those things are all <laughs> So you bet we're assuming it's one. So Dimitri's point is well put. If this was sodium chloride, you'd have to use I, because that's ionic, positives and negatives. But all these organic things and stuff are just I equals. So the concentration that comes out is big M, moles per liter. But we want to get just moles. So you can see here they made exactly one liter. So that means the moles are going to be 5.40 times 10 to the minus fourth. That's how you find the moles of hemoglobin. You can't multiply by the liters of solution that are used. And so because there was 35 grams, and there's 5.40 times 10 to the minus 4 moles here. Figure this out, molar mass, 64,800 grams per mole. In my world, that's a huge molar mass, all right? Like, I can get up to 400, maybe 500 grams per mole, but biochemistry rules the day when it comes to molar mass size, 64,800 grams per mole. Um, doing this again by freezing point, like the lab we're doing this week, would be less exciting. It would be harder to measure these big molar masses. But osmosis is really cool for the molar masses of bio things. Questions? 
Uh, osmosis is critical when it comes to medical things. And uh, you ever been in the hospital and they hook you up to the bag and stuff like that? Um, this is not pure water, all right? And the reason for it is that our blood is not pure water either. And if they put pure water in our blood, which is a solution, all right, the water would try and rush into the cells. Yeah, Liz is going, yeah, she did the death sign. And you're right, absolutely. Bad news, man. So you have to have solutions yeah, hooked up to you by IV that are isotonic. And that just means they're about the same concentration of your blood. Otherwise, bad things happen. So osmosis might have kept you alive. Woohoo! Science is cool. I'm getting too excited. <clears throat> anyway, here's um, some ideas of what's going on. In a normal isotonic thing, that means that the concentration of ions on the outside of the cells, like of your blood, is the same as the concentration on the inside, all right? So the solvent molecules going in are equal to the solvent molecules going out, and your cell is nice and healthy, all right? But you can have hypertonic and hypotonic, all right? In a hypertonic, you can see that more of the solvent molecules are going to the outside, uh, from the inside to the outside, all right? And that's going to shrink your cell, and that's going to do bad things, all right? The, the, this is a you know, kind of death symbol there. It's totally perfect. These are supposed to be pictures of the cells. On the other hand, <clears throat> all right, if you have pure water in your blood, then more solvent goes into the cells than comes out, all right? And this is what creates then these really expanded cells and apparently they can burst and I don't know anything about biology or medicine I'll be honest I take vitamin C but that's why it's falling's fault so I really don't know anything about uh, these kind of things but it is really important when it comes to medicine okay Here's a practical use for it. Um, in the old days, when water was not a problem, people didn't think about taking seawater and trying to get fresh water out of it. But starting in places like the Middle East, and even now down in Los Angeles, and I think Las Vegas too now, they are actually taking uh, water which is impure and making it pure. And reverse osmosis is a way to take out essentially the seawater or the impure water and make it drinkable, make it good stuff. Now, normally, <clears throat> all right, if you had water on one side and we'll say seawater on that side, the pure water would rush to the side of the seawater. Uh, that's what normal osmosis is. However, if you pressurize a tank, it kind of like forces the pure water through your uh, semi-permeable membrane. So if you will then, all of the sol uh, solutes here become more concentrated as the water is pushed through and you've got pure water. And this is a picture I found online. These are all little tiny tanks. The pressures are pretty large, right? 30 atmospheres is nothing to, uh, to smile at. So. But anyway, the pressures are pretty large. It pushes the water out. And this is now a viable way to get drinking water. Yeah. What do they do with the concentrated seawater afterwards? To the best of my knowledge, put it back in the sea, man. I, that's a really good question, and I don't know. So, I uh, I would imagine you know, if they had some place to store it, like a some kind of swamp. But honestly, Zeke, I don't know. Now, besides solutions, there are other types of homogeneous mixtures. And at the beginning of this chapter, that weird lecture I gave on Friday with chalk talk. Um, we're looking here in this whole chapter at homogeneous mixtures, which means two or more components, but in the same phase. And a solution, which is what we've been focusing on, is by far the most important, all right? And so solutions are what we use in chemistry most of the time. Really what makes a solution <clears throat> is that the particles, especially in the solute, are pretty small, all right? 0.2 to 2 nanometers is about what they think. 
uh, that would be two to 20 angstroms. But anyway, it's pretty small solute particle, and most of our acids and bases, salt water, most of the solutions in chemistry fall in this category. But again, because a lot of you are interested in biology and biochemistry, I feel I should talk about both what's called a colloid and what's called a suspension. Now, all three of these categories look like the same thing, more or less. They're just like solutions, all right? It, that's what I would call them. But colloids and suspensions have slightly different properties, and actually we use some of these things. A colloid is a type of a solution too, but the particles are quite a bit bigger, all right? And those bigger particles are gonna have an effect. Um, if you had any milk, soy milk or dairy milk, uh, this morning, milk is essentially a colloid. And what that means is that you have still have water as a solvent, but the proteins or whatever is in your milk, all right? Those are in there, it makes the same phase, but they're a lot bigger, so you can't see through them. Um, fog is actually a type of a colloid, all right? It looks like it's a gas, but you've got little pieces inside there. And finally, you can get to what's called a suspension. And these are even bigger particles inside. <clears throat> and things like blood and paint are good examples of this. So again, if you have like a thing of blood and you compare it to hydrochloric acid, all right, looks like it's one phase, liquid phase, but you can't see through it and stuff is easy. So there's differences between colloids and suspensions relative to solutions. And I think it's important just to overview here a little bit about what's going on. One way to distinguish if you have a colloid suspension or a regular solution is to use something called the Tyndall effect. And this is like a laser pointer, all right, like the one I'm using right now. And they just push it through, um, <coughs> they push it through different things. Now, the laser through pure water just goes right on through. But if you have a colloid or a suspension, you'll actually see the laser beam, quote unquote, kind of going through. So this is pure water, and this is some kind of a silver suspension, apparently, silver colloid, excuse me. And you can see then the laser, and that's because those bigger particles are actually interfering with the uh, light going through. If you've ever been in the forest and you've seen the quote unquote Jacob's Ladder, these kind of cool light things that are going down, this is also an effect of the Tyndall effect. <clears throat> the larger particles in the fog or whatever are interacting with the sunlight. Um, here's like a little picture kind of showing what's going on. <clears throat> you can see how these are supposed to be light beams. And because these are bigger pieces, bigger solutes definitely, the light becomes reflected and refracted. So you start seeing like a scattering pattern it's kind of a cool way to do it. Again, most of the things that we use in our chemistry labs, you would put a laser through and you wouldn't see anything because we use the smaller suspensions. But you get to hemoglobin and stuff like that. All bets are off. <clears throat> People that study colloids and suspensions, there's a lot of really cool science behind it, and we're not gonna talk about it too much, but um, so a lot of these terms here are really probably familiar to you. Um, if you have a colloid or a suspension, there is a quote-unquote solute and a quote-unquote solvent, but they call the solute the dispersed phase, and the solvent is the dispersing <coughs> medium. So you can see that the dispersing mediums, these are like the solvent, and this is like the solute. And the solvent, once again, is kind of what this is gonna look like. So shaving cream is a foam, which means that it has a solvent that's a liquid and some kind of gas inside. But the shaving cream itself doesn't look like a gas, it's more like a liquid, all right? So this is the idea there. And you can see lots of examples of these. So smoke and milk and ink, uh, cheese, <laughs> and oh yes, yogurt. Could resist. I'll have a small plain vanilla uh, in a cup to go. That's right. not fat, right? That's right. Because I'm on a special diet and the doctor said I can't have any fat. Yeah, well, there's no fat. Hey, don't throw a straw bag for me and my friends! <laughs> <laughs> hurry, Jerry, hurry! How's it doing? Not so good. Well, you can have this tested now, it's melting. So what? It changes the molecules. Oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Hey, fatso. I got a baby in biology. You call me fatso one more time, you're gonna be walking back. Um, hi, hi, I called earlier about getting 
getting the yogurt tested? No, right. Would you fill this out, please? Yes. Uh, does it matter if it's melted? No. <laughs> you know this is going to take a couple of days. That's okay. Hello there. Hello. Ooh, test tubes. Ooh. <laughs> All right, I couldn't use this for this video, and I'm really sorry for my bad video references, but this is from Seinfeld, and the idea was is that they had yogurt, <laughs> and they thought it was fat, not fat, blah, blah, blah. But the, I love it how Kramer, the guy on the left there, said, oh, you can't have a test if it melts. Well, melting is just changing the intermolecular forces, but it's still the same kind of molecules, and we know that now. <laughs> but then also, like, ooh, chemistry, test tubes, cool. So I couldn't resist putting that in there, and I apologize. So anyway, yogurt, another one of these kind of suspension things you might see in the Future. In untreated cotton, surface hydroxyl groups attract each other and make for a rough surface. Fabric softener molecules are surfactants. Their polar heads are attracted to the hydroxyl atoms, leaving their nonpolar hydrocarbon tails out. The tails, because they display weak intermolecular force, can slide past each other, thereby imparting a soft texture to the cotton. In untreated cotton, surface hydroxyl groups attract water molecules, so cotton absorbs moisture. In cotton treated with softeners, however, some hydroxyl sites are occupied, making the fabric less attractive to water and therefore less absorbent. So I'm eating my yogurt and oh, I get yogurt on my shirt. Darn it anyway, it's all dirty, all right? Well, thankfully they have detergents and uh, you can now figure out like how detergents work, which is kind of cool. Um, we're assuming that my shirt is made of cotton and cotton is basically has a bunch of hydroxyl or OH groups on it. And those are pretty strong intermolecular forces. So if we put just water over my shirt, anything that's polar, that's on, that's in the yogurt it should wash out pretty readily, all right? But the things that are nonpolar, and those are usually again like the sugars and the oils and stuff like that, water doesn't do very well with them. Joseph said about the different intermolecular forces, and he's right. So if you treat it with a detergent, a detergent is something that has both a polar side and a non-polar side. And these are really cool. So the polar side sticks to the hydroxyls on the cotton. So it's got like this non-polar side. So what happens is if your stain has something polar on it, water will take care of that, no problem. But for things like yogurt and sugars and oils and stuff, those things probably wouldn't be as effective when treated with just water. That's when these parts come in. And we're gonna see on the next slide, they kind of surround the nonpolar part and get it off my shirt. A soap micelle consists of a group of surfactant molecules with hydrophobic tails pointing inward and hydrophilic polar heads pointing outward. The micelle absorbs nonpolar oily liquids and carries them away as an oil and water colloidal dispersion. So again, you can imagine that all stains have a, probably a combination of things ionic and things that are nonpolar. And the ionic or even polar parts, water will pull out by itself really well. However, things that are like nasty and stuff like ketchup or something, you'll see then like a stain on your shirt and stuff. So that's where the detergents come in. Um, notice that these guys have, uh, they're called surfactants. They have both a hydrophobic, which means water-fearing or non-polar part, because non-polar things don't like water. And they also have a hydrophilic part. That means water-loving, something polar. Polar gets along well with polar. Non-polar gets along well with non-polar. So the stuff that the water doesn't erase, then these guys kind of surround like this. And notice it's the non-polar parts that are surrounding that big oily thing. The polar parts on the outside then will be swept through by the water you're using in your thing. So it's kind of a cool way to realize how this is. And of course detergents are a huge part of industry. Why don't oil and water mix? The hydrogen bonds between water molecules are too strong to be broken in order to produce a relatively weak interaction between water and the molecules in the oil. Thus, water excludes oil from entering the aqueous phase. So they say that oil and water don't mix, and now we can understand why. Because oils are essentially big, non-polar things, and water, as we know, isn't just polar, it's like the super hydrogen-bonded molecule of all time. 
So the strong intermolecular forces of water, if you will, exclude then the more nonpolar things. Now there is the quote unquote dipole induced dipole force, which allows some of it to go together, but pretty small amounts, all right? So that's why generally you need something nonpolar to take out something nonpolar. Cool, all right, so that's it for this chapter. Uh, let me clean this up here real fast, and let's start talking about next week's exam. So, oh boy, yeah, here we go. Next week's exam will happen during the time of the recitation. So next week, we will not talk about problem set number six. That'll be um, the last week of class, actually. Next week, what we'll do is we'll do the second midterm exam. Um, if you have lab yesterday, some of this will be reviewed. If you have lab today or tomorrow, we'll talk about this as well, too. But in a nutshell, the midterm, chapters 9, 10, and 11. So 9 was the gas laws. 10 was uh, solutions and solid, or sorry, not solutions, I'm sorry, solids and liquids, also the intermolecular forces. And then 11 definitely was the solutions. So when you come next week to lab, make sure you bring definitely your calculator, a pencil, make sure you have a 100 question total Scantron. The lab we're doing this week is called Freezing Point Depression, bring that along. And also there's an exam prep two worksheet. So just like before the first midterm, there was this exam prep, there's gonna be an exam prep for this one too. <clears throat> Um, the exam is a tiny bit different, but similar. Um, there's 20 multiple choice questions, which is similar. Um, there's seven short answer questions. So some of these are pretty short, all right? But there are a few more of them. There is a five point extra credit question thrown in. It'll be about two hours in length. And next week, you'll take the midterm, and if all goes well, I'll be able to return them then the following Friday with a summary sheet kind of saying how are you doing in the class as of this time. Um, again, we'll talk about all of this more in lab today or tomorrow if, you, if I haven't had lab with you yet. These questions now are going to be questions from these three chapters, and it'll be over all three of them. The exam should cover all three chapters about equally, so I'll show you some examples from all three chapters. All right, so let's do it. So again, if you have your calculator, I encourage you to get it out and work these problems with me, but on the other hand, you don't have to. If you're into iClicker, absolutely participate. So this is an example from the gas laws. We've got some kind of gas, it's got a volume, it has a pressure, and it has a temperature. And we want to know what the new volume is going to be at this new pressure and this new temperature. So see if you can figure out from this information what this new volume is going to be.
problems like this, there's many different ways you can do it. And all of these questions somehow revolve around the ideal gas law, P equals NRT. So let me talk about some different ways you can solve for it. <clears throat> all right, you can see that initially you have a volume, 222 milliliters, a pressure, 695 millimeter mercury, and a temperature. So one thing you could do to solve this problem is you first solve for the moles of gas, and then with that number, moles of gas, you have a new pressure and a new temperature. You could then solve for the volume, and there's nothing wrong with that. On the other hand, sometimes you can get away with using just part of it. So these are the Boyles and Charles and all those guys kind of laws. And if you look at this data of the P, V, N, and T, which ones are changing? Volume. Volume, and what else? Pressure. Pressure, that's right. The temperature is zero degrees Celsius on both sides. You're not changing how much gas you have, which is moles. So another way to do this, which would be easier, is just to realize that all of these are constant. All right, your quantity N, gas constant R, temperature, all the same. And so what you can do is that you can let a initial set of conditions equal a new set of conditions. Because uh, if P times V just equals a constant, if you make pressure goes up, volume's more, volume goes down, or vice versa. So an easier way to do this, but not a wrong way, uh, is to use this P1, V1 equals P2, V2. And you want to solve for a new volume, V2. So V2 would be P1, V1 over P2. Notice that we're not using R here. So do you have to cal uh, calculate, for example, volumes in liters or pressures in atmospheres? No. No, and that's another advantage of doing it this way instead of doing N first. Because if you do the N, then you use R, and then you have to go liters and atmospheres and Kelvin and all that stuff. So lazy chemist me, I would go uh, P1 in millimeters of mercury times V1, this number, and divide it by the new pressure. And if you do that and stuff, that comes out to be 463 milliliters. Now, I put up here the Kelvin temperatures because I want to remind you that this works really well if you're just changing pressure and volume. You don't have to go to atmospheres and, uh, and liters. But if you do decide to use T, all right, you've got to turn everything into Kelvin because you could potentially divide by a temperature and dividing by zero is really bad in math. Dividing by negative temperatures would be bad for us too because then you'd end up with weird negative volumes. And I put that up there because volume and pressure is always going to be a positive number, all right? It could be zero, possibly, all right? But you're not going to see negative volumes or negative pressures. So if you're seeing negative volumes or negative pressures, it probably means there's a temperature thing in there that's not to Kelvin. Cool. Any questions on that? PVNRT, what's the N stand for? N is moles, oh. yeah. So one way you could do this, Joseph, is to solve for moles of the gas first, and then you plug it in and solve for the new volume using this new pressure and the temperature. Okay. Density of gases is another thing that's kind of cool. And the gas density is usually reflected in grams per liter. See if you can figure out which of those gases is going to have the greatest density, assuming this pressure and temperature.
with these three ideal gas law equations, I can rule the world, or at least chapter nine. <laughs> I'm getting too excited here. But anyway, seriously, these, these are my three go-to equations in this chapter. And you don't have to use any particular one. You can mix and match. But I am putting them up here because they're really, really helpful. We already talked about PV equals NRT. P, uh, molar mass equals GRT over PV. If you have a problem where you're trying to find the molar mass of a gas, this is the one we used in lab, and it is really helpful, so just FYI. However, we don't want to use either of these probably here. We want to use the so-called evening dirt equation. So PM, evening versus AM, morning, dirt, all right. D is the density, so it's explicitly inside here. And you can see that D then is going to depend on PM, R, and T. The T and the P are all the same. So what does the density depend on in this problem? Mass. Mass, molar mass, all right? So if you want, I would go through and find the grams per mole on the periodic table for all of these things. And xenon is by far the highest molar mass. So because it has the highest M, it's going to have the largest density. As molar mass increases, the density of your gas goes up too, and vice versa. Yeah? I don't quite recall. What does P double M mean? What are these numbers called right here, Caleb? Uh, Mortal mass. Uh, Bam! Okay, that's M -M. right. Yeah, and you can use your own symbols, okay. man, and stuff. Right? But yeah, those, that's a molar mass right there. Good. You've seen uh, so many times I keep pushing these ways to find molar mass. It's, it's really important in chemistry. All right. Good. Other questions? That was a good question. Diborane is a compound that reacts with oxygen. It makes some boric oxide and water. But here's the thing I want you to think about. 1.5 liters of this diborane, the B2H6, is mixed with oxygen. And I'd like you to try and rationalize what volume of oxygen would be needed if the temperature and pressure are constant. So see if you can think about how much oxygen, and a hint, 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 the stoichiometry of B2H6 to O2 is going to be a big time part of this problem. So see if you can figure out how much volume of oxygen we're going to need if the temperature and pressure are constant. of B2H6, I said 1.5 moles of B2H6. How would you find the moles of O2 that were needed? You bet. So let's make this clear. If it was 1.5 moles of B2H6, we can use the balanced equation up there. We could say that one mole B2H6 needs three moles of O2. And again, the one to three came from the balanced reaction. So if this was moles, three times 1.5, 4.5 moles of O2 would be needed, all right? Now, in this problem, the temperature and the pressure are constant. So if you play around with this up here then, what you're seeing is that 
the pressure is constant, but volume apparently is changing a little bit. The moles are different, but the temperature and the cast constant are the same. So notice here how V and N are directly across from each other. In my world, this is a direct relationship. And what that means is that as one goes up, the other one's going to go up. Let's talk about moles because that's easier. If you have more moles of something, you're going to have more volume. And if you had less moles, you'd have less volume. Volume and moles are proportional to each other. And why this is so cool for chemists is we can literally put liters in, and if pressure and temperature is the same, you're going to have the same kind of relationship. You have to have the same pressure, the same temperature. Volume and moles are proportional to each other. So this 4.5 moles that you need from 1.5 moles also works for volume. You can usually use three liters of O2 per one liter of B2H6 to get 4.5 liters of O2. This little trick works for volume and pressure relative to moles. If the other part is constant, so in this case the pressure was constant and we're changing the volume, this is a cool relationship to use. In problem set um, four, we did that crazy tank and it had all the different gases in it. We were using moles proportional to pressure to find out the partial pressures of the gases. Prof hat off. So if you see a problem like this, you're like, what the? All right, remember this little trick. If you could do it for moles, excuse me, then usually it works for volume and pressure as well. All right, that's kind of a rule of thumb. If you start seeing changes, then you might want to go back and use the full PV equals NRT. Like literally find the moles, turn moles of B2H6 into volume of O2, or lead of moles of O2, and then find the new volume. But this is a cool kind of trick that works more often than it does. So Joseph, your question was excellent. Question. One more question before we have to quit. Here's a Diborian thing once again. This is, by the way, a type of combustion reaction. But anyway, there are three gases in this problem, all right? Diborian, oxygen, and water. And I'd like to have you put them in order of increasing velocity. So we're assuming the same temperature, all right? Look at those three gases and see if you can tell which one is slowest and which one is fastest. And Justin here is on the track team, some kind of running thing. You know. Anyway, you're, you're, you're a runner. Justin and I go to the track because I'm going to race it. All right. Justin's good shape. He's fast. He's, he's good at shape. And I definitely like pizza too much. So Justin is going to win, all right, because Justin has less mass. He can go faster. I have more mass, and I will go slower. And that's what you need to answer this question with, too. You want to find the molar masses of the three gases, all right? And the increasing one, the fastest one, is going to be the smallest molar mass, and the slowest one will be the largest. So these are the molar masses right here, 32, 28, and 18, all right? That means oxygen is like me. It's the heaviest, all right? Justin is like water, the lightest molar mass. It's going to go fastest. And B2H6 is right in the middle. So again, molar mass goes up, speed goes down, vice versa. Question? We'll do more of this on Friday. Have a wonderful day.